whenever you're ready, General. Okay, thanks very much. Um, sorry, guys, I was just a uh, slight pregnant pause while we allowed the last few from the waiting room in. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to be back in the, uh, the hot seat in the RLC Foundation uh, seminar series. Uh, great one today, one of my personal favourites. We're carrying on the, uh, the theme of digital transformation. And uh, today's subject, as I'm sure you're more than well aware, is the future management of, uh, of data. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't hold a seminar like this and not reference the terrible events that are unfolding, you know, in front of us in this devastating conflict in the Ukraine. Um, I, I don't really want to sort of talk specifically about that, but, you know, if we professionally looked at it, there are already indications that we're learning of failures of the Russian logistics planning uh, and execution as they transfer from rail to road, underestimate demand and conditions, and seemingly have miscalculated the basic physics of consumption versus their bulk lift capacity. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'd want to be one of their logistic commanders at the moment, because I suspect the pressure is uh, is on, which is, you know, personally, I'm particularly glad about that. Um, but uh, they'll be desperately trying to solve those issues. And I suspect using manual processes and communications. Um, and so all that is speculation on my part, but from my own experience, um, we have, I believe, when we're talking about the subject of data, more than appreciated the importance and centrality of data to enable us to get better information, understand and analyze our business and ultimately make better decisions. And in fact, that's a clear aim of the defense support strategy. Um, as, as I think any number of speakers have said in the past, including myself, the problem has never been data itself. We've got a veritable sea of data. The question is, is what do you do with it and how do you swim in that sea effectively um, so you get uh, the kind of business outcomes that you're seeking and the operational effect that you want to bring to bear. Uh, for most of my military career, um, although uh, obviously a few years out of date now, uh, but, but the, the basis of it, I'm sure, is still the same. Um, uh, myself and my contemporaries constantly sought to develop a common, common operating picture to answer fairly simple questions, frankly, up front. Where is my stuff? How much stuff have I got? What condition is my stuff in? Can I move my stuff where I want it? Uh, and if so, how long will it take to move it? Um, never mind the slightly more sophisticated uh, questions like how much stuff do I need and where can I get stuff closest to the point of need? And the, these kind of questions, you know, have always been, um, you know, e easy to bring out, very difficult to answer. And in reality, lacking some of the very basic data and information, we reverted uh, to oversuring our operation, operational capability by holding vast amounts of inventory forward, not unsurprisingly, because there was no uh, alternative to do that, but that becomes very inefficient and cumbersome. Um, and some of you will recognize, you know, phraseology like data is the new oil uh, in the military context for the RLC, because, you know, ultimately, um, how does this affect the RLC and how do we think about data and its application in our space? Um, we've talked for years about adding a fifth D to our military logistics planning framework. So destination, uh, distance, duration and demand, yes, but also data. Um, the trouble is, is uh, understanding the complexity of our, of our data architecture, which has evolved over time um, with no real kind of uh, uh, planning or architectural poach strip from the beginning, not unsurprisingly, um, with the way it's evolved, but relevant to our business processes and the equally and I think sometimes forgotten complex application ecosystem which is a mixture of in-house and vendor supplied software multiple technology platforms um, has presented something of a uh, I'm not sure it's a wicked problem because I sense it is solvable and I'm rather hoping when we speak to our speakers they're going to give us a feel for how we approach that but preventing us from uh, you know effectively exploiting our data um, the essence of the problem, and I do like to try and keep these difficult problems simple, has been simply we can't share information effectively across the business and we don't have the tools to analyze our business performance to improve 
uh, uh, to drive improvement effectively. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I myself, having sort of been, you know, something of a voice for this in the past, I'm delighted that we have a program and we've got, you know, really good people on the case of uh, getting after these issues um, in, you know, the shape of the development of a new business model that recognises that logistics is, um, in my view, it'd be interesting to see what the other speakers say, you know, essentially a technical a tech enabled business um, in which our biggest risk in my view would be to sit here and do nothing and I'm glad to say we're not doing nothing um, the question is is what are we doing how does it affect us and what part do we need to play uh, in taking that forward so I'm you know doubly delighted to say we've got two fantastic speakers today um, one from industry and uh, one from in uh, the Ministry of Defence uh, firstly, we're going to hear from uh, Ewan Malik, who's head of technology at uh, a company called TechModal. A lot of you will be familiar with TechModal, but uh, a data science tech company, um, very active in the defence sector, a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, BAE Systems. Now, Ewan uh, joined TechModal back in 2016 uh, as a senior developer and solution architect. Uh, at that point, he already brought 18 years of software development and technology consulting experience with him. Uh, he's worked in telecommunications, banking, and obviously most recently in defense. Um, and uh, his uh, very impressive CD uh, tells me he's a graduate with an MA in maths from Cambridge. Uh, and he went on to complete a postgraduate certificate in design, manufacturing, uh, and management also at Cambridge. Um, and then uh, went through, uh, you know, a number of what I'd say those sort of powerhouses of thinking in these kind of areas, PwC, IBM, um, until he, uh, uh, and through um, uh, the UK MOD until his current position in tech module, in tech module, sorry. Um, uh, most recently, he's led the design development and delivery of complex data-driven solutions for tech module clients. Um, and uh, including the, the UK MOD, but also uh, in the commercial space. Uh, and he, as I say, is currently the head of technology. So really looking forward uh, to hearing from Ewan. And then once we've heard from Ewan, um, we're going to go uh, inside the Ministry of Defence. And I'm, I'm really delighted on two levels that we've got the fantastic Richard Puttock, who's going to um, give us some insight in how he is getting his arms around that potentially wicked problem I was talking about. Um, uh, and I'm doubly delighted because Richard is still uh, recovering from COVID. And so we're really glad you managed to make it today, Richard, and you know, really appreciative of that effort to be here. Now, um, some of you may know Richard again, um, but just to be clear, um, Richard is the CIO for the defence support area in defence. Um, his team is uh, responsible for the design coherence and governance across the defence support organisation uh, in itself, you know, a, a large and disparate uh, responsibility. Um, that his organisation has got wide reach, taking responsibility for architecture, design and integration of capabilities and services. Um, and uh, he's responsible really for delivering the defence support strategy elements that uh, relate to uh, the information space. Um, I think uh, he, he gave me a little explanation, which is you know, nice and succinct, which is great because I think it is a very complex area, but um, he's described it as introducing an architectural approach to define uh, our business needs with common processes, structures and metrics, building an information-led organization, designing a capable and resilient enterprise, and introducing best-in-class digital services. No small task. <laughs> so, uh, you know, really, really looking forward to hear how Richard has taken that forward since uh, I first met him when he was working in the DENS in the delivery organisation. Um, now, before I hand over to um, uh, Ewan first, uh, can I just remind everybody that uh, with our online seminars, because they are recorded, um, uh, we uh, we are on the record, uh, and there and there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, as usual, for about thirty minutes or so. So do please take advantage of the chat function to ask questions as we go along. Uh, I'll be monitoring that, and I'll bring those questions forward on your behalf to the panel uh, that we'll hold at the end. Excellent. So on that note, Ewan, I'm going to hand across to you, and looking forward to hearing from. 
Thank you, Angus. Um, I shall share my screen. Hopefully everyone should be able to see that full screen now. Russ, can you confirm? Uh, not yet, I can't. Can you see the front page now? Yeah. Yeah. No. Good. Good start for the technology. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for that introduction, Angus. Uh, and I'd just like to echo your points about thank you to everyone for joining, especially at this time when I'm sure everyone's lives are extremely busy. Um, as you said, we're looking at today the future management of data or future of data management. Um, and my few slides, there aren't too many, don't worry, are uh, around how do we make sure we've got the right tools for the jobs in front of us. Um, so quick introductions, Angus has covered some of this. So TechModal, the company I work for, we're um, focused primarily in defense. We're a data science, data exploitation, data management, Company. Some of you will know us through our work within Defence and specifically for this forum, our OA team who are, off, who are deployed into Defence support and um, working hard at the moment on our steam scenarios regarding Eastern Europe. Um, we've been working with Defence for over 15 years and um, offer a full capability from business function analytic and analysis into application prototyping, application build and uh, deployment. Um, we're Bristol based, 200 of us now, and about 18 months ago, we were acquired by BA Systems. Um, we're still an autonomous business unit within that, and we're looking to bring our skills to the new BA Systems Digital Intelligence Sector. On me, the technology responsible for making sure that what we do is appropriate, achievable, and ambitious. By that, I mean, if the clients are working in Excel, selling an, a dream of machine learning, maybe a great dream, but it's not quite what's suitable right now. So we need to make sure we're with people on that journey, with defense, with um, as you see at the bottom, NHS, rail, and other defense industry partners. Um, the bit of my CV, Angus didn't, maybe I didn't share with Angus, is that the other side of it is I, I like running up mountains. So um, if you want to divert onto that as a set of questions, that's also fine. Um, the core question we're thinking about here, data management. What is data management? So um, to try and get a succinct answer to that, I went to the Data Management Association, Dharma. Um, they have what they call a book of knowledge, which is about 700 pages of PDF uh, about data management. Um, if anyone really wants to get into the real nitty gritty in the depths of it, I can recommend you read that, um, but it is quite dense. What I picked out from that and from my experience is that data management is about improving your business aims, your business and organization aims. It's not about the data looking pretty. It's not about um, collecting data for data's sake. We have to focus on what are the aims of the business and how can we leverage the data we have or work out what data we need to enable those aims and improve the success of the organization of the business. Um, there are many aspects to data management. This is uh, Dharma, the Data Management Association wheel, as they call it. Um, 
And you can really see for yourselves the different aspects that they reference for data management. Now, all of these have relevance to the um, different sections of the data lifecycle. Data lifecycle being plan, what data you need, design your systems to uh, capture it, well, to use that data, collect the actual data, store it somewhere, exploit it, work out what you need to do to prove next, go around again, and at some point possibly dispose of it. Now in the business we're in, in the world of multi-domain multi integration and interoperability, uh, the world of open data and um, public data sets, open source intelligence. There are two facets of the data management wheel that often come into conflict. Security and governance. So in our world, we need to keep our data secure. We need to make sure the right people have access to it, but people that aren't authorized don't have access to it. But then we have this ambition of interoperability and integration. How do we how do we square that circle? How do we work out the keeping the data secure, keeping it with the people that need to know it, but also making it accessible to those people, making it so that we can collect it once, store it once, use it many times. It's a challenge. It's a challenge that's also been faced by industry, not just in defense. Um, we'll look at some of those in a bit. If we come back to the data life cycle, um, this bit, collect and store, pretty much everyone is very good at. You know, it's easy to collect data and it's relatively easy to store it. So often data-driven projects, data-driven um, initiatives focus on that as uh, the target. Let's get hold of the data. Let's, let's, let's get it somewhere where we can have it and use it. And it's that second point, use it. How well do we use it? We need to consider the full data life cycle. Because these other ones, I'm sure you've all experienced systems where there's a vast amount of data, but you don't know what it's telling you. You don't know uh, the provenance of it. How old is it? Has it been quality checked? Is it superseded by new data? The need to actually manage the data, you know, looking at quality and architecture in which it sits in, looking at the reference and master data, which allows us to understand what we could learn from the data. Where can we apply this data? Where can we exploit it? Those aspects are hard. They're not. There, there, there isn't an easy solution, which is um, uh, you know, just technology just to uh, fix it all. We need to think and to design and to spend time on what I get told off by our sales team for calling the boring necessary stuff, um, stuff that actually allows us to move forward with data which is well managed which is, um, has the appropriate metadata to allow us to catalog it, has the appropriate um, security markings, for example, to allow us to be confident in how we're sharing it. All these things um, take time and take effort and require an attitude to data which treats it as a strategic asset. So, just like we control access to the strategic the physical assets, which we use to achieve effect, we can consider data as a strategic asset. Now, data as a strategic asset has certain unique properties that other assets don't have. Data has a value. We all know data has a value. You know, Google and Facebook and etc. make money from our data um, but we can't keep hold of it. It's just ones and zeros in a database somewhere, translated in a certain way. We can't physically pick it up. We can put it on a storage device. But it's not particularly tangible. 
it's durable. So what, how, if we're talking about strategic asset maintenance and the sort of questions that Angus was talking about at the beginning, is there a concept of consumption for data? It doesn't have a consumption rate. It probably doesn't have a mean time between failure, but yet it will depreciate over time. The older the data gets, often the less value it has. So there are parallels you can draw with the consumption models that we use for uh, transporting equipment overseas, for example. Can we do the same for data? Is that 5D on the, uh, on the logistics set of Ds? Does that, what measures can we use for data? So in the non-tangible aspects, we can share it and transport it very easily. That falls back into the governance. Who gets to share it? Who gets to transport it? Who do we share it with? It's easy to do. But if we do it incorrectly or we lose the data, well, it is destroyed. It's very hard to replace. Data is not consumed when you use it. So again, back to the durability. And the second part of this, it can be stolen. We can lose the asset and yet still have it. There are several um, interesting challenges around who's using the data at the same time. I'm sure we've all been in uh, meetings where data has been used to generate some answers, some pictures on a slide. Now, those pictures on the slide, if you, can you, when someone argues with that data and says, well, I use the same data to get this answer, how do we know which is right? How do we know what the answer is that we need to get to? These are challenges which are being experienced across industry and they're being experienced within defense. I looked in the um, data strategy, one of the strategies that came out last year and picked out a couple of components. I'm sure you've all seen these before. Um, but data is a key component of a digital backbone in the MOD digital strategy. But we shouldn't be thinking about digital backbone and all the activity going on in that is trying is the goal should not be to have a single system that does all this for us that can't ever work the other important thing to point out is data is only one strand of this digital strategy we need the people the processes and the technology to support that data and be supported by the data and in fact the, the data is merely the enabler for most of these um, integrations on the right hand side so just as we need to train people to maintain, operate a strategic asset, a traditional strategic asset, so a tank, a ship, an aircraft, people need to be trained and understand the importance of maintaining and operating data assets. These are key functionality to our delivery of effect. Now, finally, get, getting on to the what's coming over, over a hill, what's coming around the corner. What are the key features of the future of data management as we see it at TechModal? The people. The people are the future. It's no point having data if there's no one to interpret it, if there's no one to make decisions on it, or if they don't understand the data they're seeing and the uh, outcomes, the information they're seeing. So data literacy is a key future aspect. We all need, we, a lot of us have it, you know, data pervades our daily lives. It, um, we all know the intrinsically know that there's value in our personal data, which is exploited, as I said, by some of the large social media and retail companies. We 
how do we unlock that value? Well, we, it's very hard for an individual to do that. As an organization, having people who are data literate, and I don't, that doesn't mean we all need to be coders. We don't all need to be um, writing code or accessing data directly, but we need to all understand what applications and what data is telling us. So interpreting outcomes from scenario modeling, for example, how do we, as long, we all need to understand that to ask us the right questions of the people providing that analysis. What is, what's this, what's the provenance of this data? How have you got to that answer? How do we trust the answer? And that comes through having an understanding of the data literacy so that we can properly challenge people like myself who will stand in front of people and say, well, this is what the data is telling us. We need to be challenged and we need to be told to um, show me, prove it, help me understand. The second big change that's ongoing at a minute is automation. Automation isn't the robots coming to take our jobs. Um, automation should be the robots coming to make our jobs easier. So there are lots of places in data world where automation is relevant. Um, data collection, for example. So a lot of our equipment is now covered in sensors. All, that's, all those sensors can automatically collect, collate, and organize the data coming off those platforms, coming from these other systems. That generates a vast volume of data. And back to my earlier slide about collection and storage. That's great. Let's collect it and store it. But what then? How do we how do we actually use it? So there's, there's also automation around data categorization. So what sort of data is this? Is it failure data? Is it normal running data? Is it um, an emergency data? You know, what can what how can we categorize this data for? and apply metadata to it. So that descriptive data about data to say, to tell the humans, to tell the operators, to tell the support staff what's going on with that piece of equipment, what's going on with that vehicle so that we can quickly and easily exploit it. We shouldn't need data coming off a vehicle to go back and be analyzed you know, back in caution or elsewhere and then come back out to the field for it to be acted upon. We should be acting on it in, in theatre, in, in real time, effectively. I know Project Theseus is looking at that last mile supply, real time logistics of and, and automation coming into that. There's also data cleansing. We know we've got years and years and years worth of data, there's terabytes of it, hundreds of terabytes. Is it good quality? Can it be cleansed? That's a very tedious job to do manually. So applying uh, data science and machine learning to identify dirty data. So dirty meaning it could be duplicate, it could be incomplete, it could be very out of date. Um, also applying machine learning and natural language processing to text fields. So. There's a lot of data that's held in documents and free text fields. Um, can we apply data science and machine learning to that to draw out that, to structure it, to give it, add some of this data categorization and allow us to actually exploit that data? Getting a bit further into the weeds and apologies, but uh, I think it's important. Data mesh solutions. So. Um, you've probably all heard of uh, data lakes, databases, definitely. Data lakes were a effectively very large databases of lots and lots of data. Um, as Angus said in his uh, introduction, we live in a world where there are many, many legacy systems, many systems where we have collected a lot of data and exploited it and it sits in that system of record and it is highly unlikely or 
at least unlikely to be successful, to try to bring all that data together in one place to then exploit it further. So we don't want to be trying to move all the data out of James and SS3 and CRISP and BWIMS and trying to bring it all together in one place to do an exploitation. The key steps are to make that data more accessible from it, where it is at the moment. We don't need to drag it out en masse and re-architect it somewhere. Those very large transformation, technology transformation projects will, while being very well intentioned, have the habit of taking so long, but by the time you finish them, the technology you've been implementing is out of date. And you've got all the problems of trying to aggregate all the data in one place. What a data mesh solution does is within the wire of defense, but potentially with the right um, controlled access, reaching out into industry and wider public, is enable that access to the right data at the right time. So rather than grabbing all the data and then having a problem with, well, it's still collected over there in James and it's still, but we're trying to exploit it in this new system. Let's just access James or Gemma as it's going to be. Having systems where that interoperability and integratability is designed in and commercially contracted in from the start so that it doesn't cost us in defense a million pounds per interface. You know, we want it in those, those commercial barriers, those governance barriers, we need to work with the technology to enable the people to access the data when they need it, where they need it. Final one I'm gonna say kind of carries on from that in that it's not one system to rule them all. We're not looking for the future isn't one provider, one answer, one system that everyone accesses. That boil the ocean approach is slow and carries a high risk. Let's boil lots of cups of tea instead and everyone gets their cup of tea quickly and easily. It's got the right contents, it's got the right data. So if you combine a data mesh, you combine upskills, upskilled people, automated collection, and then targeted tools. As I said, right at the beginning, uh, if we're doing work with the OA community, we're on the secret network, Excel might well be the right tool. It's not particularly flashy, it's not particularly exciting, but if it gets the answer to the right people in a reasonable piece of uh, space of time, then it, it's fine to use Excel. We don't need to always be pushing the envelope of new technologies. We need to do the right technology at the right time. Equally, you're not going to get a complex data cleansing task using machine learning done in Excel. You're going to need a data science platform, which is where things like the Digital Foundry come in. Um, and uh, app, the, the Defense Digital Analytics platform, where you can do these more advanced activities. But again, we're not saying that everyone needs to do that. It's the right tool for the right job at the right time. The um, caveat to all of that, of course, is that if you are building tools in the technology you've got now and building a focus solution for a problem you need to solve now, you need to have one eye on that future proofing. So what happens when Modcloud Secret is available and suddenly you've got a lot more capability offered than we have at the moment? Well, we need to keep an eye on, well, can I, can I do a solution now that is then portable to that? So again, it's that interoperability point. It's the, the need for getting the right answer now, but having an eye, an eye on what's coming up in the future. All of this together should empower data owners, data users, data citizens, as we all effectively are, to have the right data at the right time answering the questions they have at the moment. And those questions could be what Angus characterized as simple ones earlier. 
although having tackled some or tried to tackle some of those in the past, so never seem that simple when you dig into it. Or they could be even more complex questions that would require more time to solve, more investment. Um, I'm going to quickly look at some uh, examples that some of our teams have provided for me. So the our OA team are currently um, embedded in defence support, led by Richard Pasco. If he's on the call, he might be. I think he might be too busy. They use a tool they call JSAM, which looks at some of the problems that Angus was talking about earlier. Some of you may have seen them use it. But because it's on secret and it's um, a analyst driven tool, Excel and Power BI are the right answers at that point at the moment. At some point in the future, we, it might get upgraded to a more, te a more advanced technological solution. But it does the job that's needed at this, at this moment to look at the um, ES material and consumption of proposed operations. Obviously anything you're seeing, as you can tell by the word illustrative, isn't real. Um, Carry, group, carry strike group 21, Op Fortis that we worked on is an example of bringing together cross industry data sets. So um, Navy, Babcock, BAE systems, strategic command data sets and applying more advanced techniques to it than the JSON model. So again, it's looking at trying to predict failures, trying to predict um, failures at subsystem level, which are then rolled up into a system to say, okay, given the activity that the carrier strike group were planning to do, what failures can we predict? And the two modes to that. One is the um, linear maths of doing mean time between failure. So when did it last fail? How often does it fail? Add one to the other, and you'll get a date where you can predict potentially a failure. That's a fairly standard way of doing it based on historical data. The other way is to look at predictive analytics to try and work out through a um, machine learning model what are the key attributes of a failure, an opdef, and what are the situations in which those attributes are triggered and then map those onto the proposed um, uh, activity and to produce the challenges aren't always technological. We can sometimes hit uh, governance or commercial challenges, especially when you're trying to get BA and Babcock to play nicely together. Um, that continues to be a challenge. Defensive analytics platform within Strategic Command Defense Digital. That is, a, again, an attempt to get ModCloud properly utilized using those more advanced techniques that ModCloud give us and the cloud benefits of scalability and transferability. There are several uh, use cases sat on that now, which is um, providing a useful uh, exploration of the adoption of cloud within defense. It's good to see it actually being adopted. It's going, it is happening. It's a real thing. And it's driving out some of the challenges around the people skills. So how, if you're offering an analytics platform, you expect people to come to it with those skills. So we need to upskill the people to be able to utilize an analytics platform reliably. And that, again, is an enduring challenge. Veritas, a lot of you have heard of um, in the Army. And again, this is more an example of the data management piece where we have done that old school thing of bringing lots of data together and ex uh, then having lots of applications on top of it to exploit it. We're looking at delaminating that. So taking that engineered data, structured data, um, well managed data and saying, right, that, there's your data. Let's have more access to more apps on top of it for what people need to do. 
final one, we all know what's coming down soon. We've got lots of core system update projects. My HR is underway, Future JK is on its way, Gemma is in bid at the moment, GMFS is coming down the road soon. I'm sure there are many others. The key point for that is let's make sure we've got interoperability and integratability uh, uh, baked in from the start. Uh, I'm going to end there. My time is up. Um, I'll hand over to Richard. And I'll answer questions later. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name is Richard Partick, Defence Support CIO. And like all the other speakers here to talk to you today about uh, our view on data management. Um, as most people acknowledge, not perhaps one of the most appealing topics in the world of logistics, but certainly one of the most important. Um, I'm intrigued to find how much in, I have in common with Ewan, um, including having worked for some of the same companies, though I prefer to walk up mountains and run down them. So uh, there is a little bit of difference there. Um, clearly, since we have a similar background, he's been able to steal some of my ideas, even down to the point of using some of the same diagrams, though I look to be able to give them a, a different twist. Actually, it's good news that the MOD and industry share a lot of the same views because many of our problems need to be solved together. Um, I'll apologize up front um, for the way I sound. Uh, as Angus mentioned, I've just had COVID um, and there may be some uh, coughing and spluttering that I'll need to cover up at, uh, at various points. My aim is to share with you um, a vision and a shopping list. Uh, the vision is where we need to move data services to in the next four years. The shopping list is the basket of items that I'm buying or borrowing uh, to get there. Um, so uh, last thing is, uh, since this, this is mid afternoon, I hope that everyone has their cup of tea and, uh, and biscuit by their side. So next slide, please. Um, firstly, of course, I have to situate the CIO function within the Defence Support Organisation and where my team sits under the joint support pillar. So I report to General Simon Hutchings and joint support delivers the ongoing work of the support enterprises, capabilities, policy, performance, uh, supply chain operations, information services. Uh, the two other pillars represent support transformation, the work of changing the current enterprise into something newer, um, better, more effective, and support operations that looks at the 10 to 15 year horizon of what defense support will provide, needs to provide to operations and the frontline commands. Support transformation is important to mention because it represents the great hope for radical improvement of support to meet those future operational capabilities. It has the ambition to deliver some 10 billion pounds of savings over 10 years. But the good news is that's by investing up front. So we're, depending on how you count it, um, approximately 700 million pounds, principally through a program that's been mentioned already, business modernization for sport. And what I'm going to describe to you in the following slides, our, our objectives for data management support, the funding for the delivery of this ambition comes in the main from BMFS because effective data provision underlies all of transformation. And also worth a mention that what all three pillars are attempting to do is underpinned by the defense support strategy, which I'm sure everybody here uh, will have uh, uh, read um, because if you're in logistics or engineering or equipment management, it certainly counts as the must read publication. And one of its primary messages, which I'm sure you won't have missed, is how much we depend upon data to deliver the support advantage that we all seek. Uh, so moving on, if you may. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I'm looking to do <coughs> in this session is to express how information integration for support will be realized as a concept of, in the initiatives I'll be putting forward. And not forgetting that we're not doing data and information integration for its own sake, but in, instead to enable many other things of which the primary item has already had um, a couple of mentions to drive the, an underlying improvement in the availability of our platforms and equipment. Uh, putting it simply and using just one service example that will be sending fewer warships to sea with ca disabled capabilities because we haven't been able to get the right part to the dockside at the right time. Now, it, it isn't a state secret to say that currently defence data suffers from a number of major inhibitors. You know, we operate with a number of contractual um, uh, and, and technical platform inhibitors. Uh, we also have behavioural um, silos to, to break down. We have an inherently complex business model in the way in which we work with shared and sometimes unclear accountabilities. And so thus we've spread already across a number of organizational boundaries, but, but that's only a small part of the problem. We have significant constraints in terms of the age of our applications. Um, you know, as people will know, some of our key inventory systems reach back to the 1970s, at least in, in concept, but the technical platforms on which they sit, our inability to migrate them to the cloud, the number of overlapping capabilities that we deliver in, in this environment. The, the picture we refer to as our tube map shows the main elements of those 120 applications and the web of interactions and interdependencies that have been constructed over time between those applications largely, and this is the important thing, in a piecemeal fashion. Imagine data traversing these independently built and very sparsely connected nodes. Uh, one historic factor that's been particularly pernicious is that when we've replaced an application in this landscape, oftentimes we've taken the approach that says, we will retain the existing interfaces unchanged so as to avoid having to modify surrounding applications. That means that the lines on the diagram are often connections that are older and more inadequate than the applications they actually connect. And the data flowing across those interfaces may have been specified 20, 30, or even longer years ago when definitions and capabilities were, were far different. The next slide, please. So the complexity, unfortunately, doesn't exist across only that dimension. Because our data is fragmented across these 120 applications, we have many more distinct data fields than you might expect. Yes, we've got you know, a huge variety in what Defence Support covers, but I estimate that we have some 60,000 data fields across our core systems. We've started counting, by the way, but at the moment we're only at about 35,000. Now, many of these, <coughs> of course, are duplicates or, or just differently formatted representations of the same thing. But that doesn't get away from the fact that we have to manage at the level of the 60,000. Now, that is what the data management challenge is. And we realize we have another dimension to the complexity. Um, we, we have a significantly lower velocity than other organizations doing um, you know, nationwide distribution. For, for example, uh, Sainsbury's um, just one you know, regional distribution center might handle as many as 50 million cases per, per annum, whilst we probably handle 2 million items from everywhere. But the flip side is we handle a much, much wider variety of items. Uh, again, Sainsbury's typically might have 30 to 40,000 
SKUs, those are independently identified retail items. And you've got to compare this with our 700 odd thousand live items, plus uh, quite a few, uh, another sort of 600,000 or odd obsolete ones. So that also contributes to the 60,000 um, data fields. If you have many different items, each of which has some unique characteristics, then that needs to be recorded. But back to general phase um, point. Yes, it's uh, the complexity is underlying, but the, the questions we want to answer is incredibly simple. What is an item? You know, what, what's the identity of this thing? Where is it? Uh, and is, is it use, usable? Well, what state is it in? Is it, is it uh, fit for combat? Does it need to be um, inspected? Does it, is, does it need to be repaired? You know, um, <coughs> has it got to have a temperature check? Well, the essential things that enable something to be usable. So what do we got to get is from this complexity to simplicity. So it's the job of data management, in my definition, to interpret the complex sources and make the information available to the ultimate end user in the simplest, most convenient form. And I'm going to emphasize the ultimate end user. Because the power of data is realized when the person closest to the problem has access to that data. It helps them understand why that problem exists and, and gives them a means to solve it. Now, that colleague may belong to a third party working in a warehouse in Donington or in the land weapons delivery team in a DNS in Abbey Wood, but they're just as likely to be a hanger in Bryce Norton or out in Akrotiri. They need the data to be recognizable and specific to their domain and easy to access. I should also point out, and I, I was very pleased to hear this emphasized previously, that they require the skills to interpret and manipulate that data too. That's what asking the right questions is about. And that's something that the RLC skills review, from whom I have, by the way, stolen the graphic on this slide, they're addressing this right now. And I'm really pleased to see that there are initiatives like that taking place, looking to address what skills we need to handle data on the front line, because intelligence. I'm not really the, the provider. And it, um, data is the new oil. You've already heard that articulated. So I'd like to take that argument a bit further um, and follow through on the analogy. Um, it's easy to think about the various exciting dashboards and semi-autonomous control towers, you know, receiving and processing significant amounts of data in real time, taking immediate decisions, turbocharging the behavior of an organization, the, the bit down the bottom, the shiny outputs in, in, in D. Uh, and this always makes me think of, of CSI um, Las Vegas, where, you know, in the lab, in their white coats, they start waving their hands around and data appears on a piece of glass with all the, all the results you could ever, ever wish for. And that's delightful, um, but actually Clive's, Humby's quotation, data is the new oil, carries another message, which is in the following sentence, it's valuable, but if unrefined, it cannot be used. So what we're less good at and what we need to work on as our way through this frankly boring foundational work, of collating, curating, transforming that data into something that's usable. Uh, and let's look at what those sort of sources are and the challenges they bring. So, so firstly, sticking with the, the analogy, there's the, the large relational database management systems um, in our uh, key um, commercial off the shelf software packages which are really quite easily exposed and, and can be accessed re, uh, repeatedly in, an, in, an, in a pattern-based fashion. You don't need that much skill to get at it. But then there's the data in the contested environment. 
where that maybe there's a contractual boundary. Maybe there's that physically we can't get access. Maybe it's a, a, an IPR issue. And I could I could point to a number of contracts, especially in the air domain, um, where we're actually locked out of, uh, of the data that supports a particular platform. Um, thirdly, there's the, the, the databases that sit maybe not snugly in a data center somewhere, very easy to access, but are, but are out in, in the field in some shape or form and are often quite customized to the environment into which they have been delivered. Uh, and then there are, and we must acknowledge these, the utterly obsolete platforms, which still have data that is vital to us, but it's extremely hard to, to extract. Uh, and I am, not personally, but my organization is spending hundreds of thousands of pounds just to get data um, available to us, uh, simply because, you know, we're talking with, about non-relational technologies and um, platforms where there are no skills and understanding any longer. And lastly, there's the, the, the uncontrolled local spreadsheet problem that we're, we're all familiar with. I do particularly like the image of the idea that you can have a little nodding donkey oil well in your own back garden. Um, but that's what it's like in terms of this analogy. So all these things have to be uh, have to be catered for, the data has to be um, extracted before you can ho hope to apply any kind of transformation to it in order to then deliver it out to the multitudinous use cases that mean it can actually be exploited. So bringing all the data together in a consistent manner is a big and a long job. Um, and I think as the Defence Support CIO main task in the data space is to enable that. Um, next slide, please. And wherever we think of data, and in fact, that's what this is what I was doing in the last slide, the inclination is to think on the vertical axis of this diagram, is to think about different kinds of data and the technology and the tooling. But you don't get things like master data management simply by identifying a domain of data and buying a tool. The people and the process are essential to extracting value from it. Um, uh, the <laughs> simplest I could, example I could give is a few years ago, a pre, uh, organization which was predecessor of defense support uh, invested in buying an enterprise level master data management package and did precisely nothing with it because there was no funding, there was no organizational support, there was no skills investment. It was just meant to happen magically. That's not how data management works. Data management needs the mechanistic processes repeatable of cleansing and profiling and standardization and reporting, as well as the people who own, control and administer data. Without the horizontal dimension, we will achieve very little in this space. Uh, next one down, please. And here's the here's the um, the unashamed plagiarism that Ewan was was going in for. Yeah. Um, it's good to know that we're not alone in this endeavor. Basically, Defence Digital is investing a significant amount of effort in developing what it terms its digital backbone. And one of those four key strands is data. And the relatively new chief data officer, Caroline Bellamy, is there to drive this work. So under the umbrella of the digital strategy defense sit a number of sub-strategies, and it's already been referenced that the immediate, most immediately relevant one is Caroline's defense data strategy. And that articulates a vision of defense data as an enduring strategic asset. Second only, it says to our people, and that defense data will be maintained as an asset and maximization of value from that asset will be extracted. Now, those, these are all good words, of course. What does it mean in practice? Well, defense support is investing in data management, but so is defense digital alongside us. At a call earlier this week, 
where, for example, we were talking about the overlap between our desire to catalog our, our data. Remember those 60,000 data items? And the pilot the Defence Digital is running of a tool and a process and a team to support this. Now, we won't always have the same needs. We won't always have the same priorities. But we are absolutely pointing in the same direction with regard to our investments in defence support and in the centre. And that really matters um, because, as I'm sure you're aware, MOD is very capable of frittering away money by doing things in multiple places uh, insufficiently well. And I see that really changing quite significantly. Uh, next slide, and I will be pleased to know I'm on my last two um, before my voice gives out. So I'm going to leap here to a potential end state. So back to what business modernization for support, the key transformation program is laying out as uh, a new landscape that I, I expect to deliver. Um, by the way, although I'm going to concentrate on the data services element of the transformation outlined in those, those red dots in this picture, I do want to emphasize that BMFS is doing a number of other very large things, process transformation, the introduction of other enablers such as the common user platform to provide for the majority of users the entry point into support information services, but data services occupy 50% of this diagram. And that's quite right. <laughs> so what is it actually going to net down to? Well, it is, dis despite Ewan's um, describing this as old school, I'm into old school, we're going to have a support data warehouse that collates the stable historic data from across defence support in order to be able to deliver cohered reporting and historic analysis. So if you want to find out what happened to a demand raised a month ago, any demand raised anywhere a month ago, the support data warehouse will tell you. Uh, certainly a consistent and as far as possible single way of delivering data exchanges between the authority and industry. Um, the way in which we do it at the moment is just uncontrolled, unmanaged, project dependent, um, and is probably the biggest security risk I run with. I was recently also discussing with some industry reps who believe that there is millions of pounds of cost locked up for them in how they interface with the MOD, with a lot of swivel chair style interfacing, a lot of inconsistency between the way in which uh, and what the definitions of the data that are passed between the two organisations. And then at least Ewan should be pleased about this. I'll be looking to an operational data layer to capture transactions as they navigate the systems and interfaces in real time. So this is proper instrumentation, if you like, not API based, um, allowing you know, status and ad hoc query as to what's going on across the defense support network right now at any given uh, point. But it's gonna take longer to get there. Most of those 120 odd applications aren't easy to, to open up. And only as we replace them progressively will that operational data layer really become uh, a reality. Um, uh, another slightly unsexy thing, um, but absolutely necessary, an archiving service with safe, enduring, auditable records. A reference data service to define and control master and reference data across the estate. And unstructured data management to be able to ingest the significant amount of signal and sensor data that are currently being produced, but will be produced in immensely much greater volumes as platforms and networks become increasingly digitized. And all of these, all of these things need to be supported by data catalogs, defining how and where data is owned and disseminated across that network, data quality evaluation and correction, rapid and consistent ingestion and integration techniques. God, that sounds like an awful lot. But here I'm now going to put it into my shopping basket and say what I'm going to start off with. So next and last slide. So getting to the Nirvana, 
these are the six themes that I'm going to build on over the, the next three years. There really is something behind this. I've got 22 packages of work defined with, you know, with funding identified and you know, budget outlay and, how, and rough ideas of how long this is going to take. So we've really recently launched the support data warehouse um, as of uh, two months ago which already has an unparalleled richness in terms of what it offers from you know, MJDDI as deployed, all of the base inventory management systems, engineering um, systems, pricing systems, we're getting in um, data from Army and from other places, updated on a daily basis. <clears throat> yeah. But we recognize the need, actually, that's great having the source, we need to offer as many routes to exploitation as we can, we already have reporting tools which we don't make decent use of their, their rich capabilities, but we're looking also to introduce more advanced data science tooling for the potential providing significant value into operational planning and analysis. And we want direct access from such tools into the support data warehouse daily. So at one end, the casual user sitting on their ModNet laptop can benefit from being able to do the lightweight analytics and dashboard that the work that they can teach themselves. Well, on the other end, we've got teams building regular support performance metrics who will also be working in the same way. In the same, in the way we want to get that, that demand side working, we also want uh, to make sure that the supply side doesn't just sit with the systems we've got ready. So we're already looking next year at bringing in fuels data, uh, additional movements data, munitions, hazardous items. You know, we're, get, we're going after every bit of defense support business data we can, we can find. Um, so great having a warehouse. Uh, by the way, it won't look like the picture in the top left. However, my, you remember what I said about the, the richness in terms of the data items, the complexity but the low velocity, we haven't actually got that much volume. We're really in the low terabytes space, even if we bring everything in, uh, into play. But I would like it to look nice in shininess. But a warehouse needs, as I've already said, those cataloging and quality improvements. Otherwise, actually what we have is a data swamp, not a lake. And the model, this picture here, by the way, is the top level of our conceptual data model for defense support. And we have a set of logical data models underneath it. And we need to tie those to the physical level, to those 60,000 data items. Uh, clearly, by the way, we're not going to do that by locking three people in a dark room and giving them a number of spreadsheets. This has actually got to be done using what we can of the latest in artificial intelligence and assessment so we can actually process um, some intelligent decisions about where those 60,000 uh, data items should go. What are important, what are not, what are duplicates, what are not, uh, what are simply synonyms and what are not. And the third element, um, master and reference data solution to make the common data consistent across our applications. Such simple things as lists of UINs or hazard codes, you know, they should be managed once, identified what is the master, managed once and distributed many times to where they are, where they are required. So master and slave is clearly uh, outlined rather than being maintained individually and independently in our applications as it stands at the moment. And we'll move out, I hope, on the reference data management element of that very quickly. Fourth, the data foundation for real-time decisioning. That's the, you know, the really exciting bit, um, which goes way above and beyond historic management information, a platform to ingest events and sensor outputs in a real-time or near real-time manner. So to deliver a basis for those high velocity activities, automated decisioning, digital twins, you can't do a load of the exciting things without bringing this data together on a single foundational basis. It's what cuts the legs off most of the, our advanced um, attempts to work in, in some of the new spaces. Um, I've mentioned integration 
with appropriate roles and responsibilities. So it all comes back to the people in the end. So I mentioned these six themes, I'm delivering or aiming to deliver 22 separate packages of work, yes, over a three year time frame, a big shopping list, a long amount of time, but really coming together rather than being separate, individual, disparate, partially funded initiatives. Coherence, consistency, data management. Um, thank you everybody for um, listening to that, um, allowing me to share my vision of, of data and defense support with you, if only briefly and schematically. And I can do some question management if you want. I've got a list of questions on my other screen. I was going to say there is a big list of questions if you would like to start in the in the uh, in the chat. Okay, um, I'll start from the top. It says for me, which is nice. Thank you. Um, so a question by Nick. Uh, Nick asks, superimpose over the attributes of the Dharma data management wheel are the significant and ever present issues of internal politics and the millstone of legacy systems. Um, how might the clarity of a unified data vision like Caroline's help us overcome the socio-political complexity? Um, well, I feel like Richard's kind of covered this. Um, you did a, an, I mean, I think both Rich and I focusing on not just the data, but the people, the process as well, emphasizes that point, Nick. It's very much a data and tech aren't necessarily the answer, they're the enablers, as we've both said. So I think having that strategy from Caroline and having a coherent CIO vision across the CIOs, across the different TLBs and um, organizations within defense, and that much clearer um, understanding of problems at legacy systems and internal, not invented here, um, attitudes that we sometimes see can, pro can produce those problems. So it's having that education for people and upskilling of people and the right processes in place to enable the CIO teams to do what Richard's laid out. I'm going to add, add to that, if I may. I'm seeing a very much stronger and more coherent view within defence as a whole, led by Charlie Ford as the, the MOD CIO, um, to both cajole um, and sometimes to direct more than has been done ever before from the centre that we in the functions and in the frontline commands will engage with the digital backbone and, and the data um, aspects of, of that in particular. So, you know, all of the chiefs and the vice chiefs are signed up to the data strategy. And I, I can see, um, you know, one star um, uh, boards, meetings in place, um, work going on that means I have very much more faith in the coherence uh, of this and thus the ability to uh, manage across those socio-political boundaries. Uh, I don't in any way minimise, however, the difficulties of the defence operating model and, and the, the Levine versus other views of how how things will be controlled. All I can say is it looks a darn sight better to me than it has before. Excellent, thanks, uh, Richard. I'm back. I dropped out, lost my hosting uh, uh, rights and uh, therefore was, uh, thank you, Ewan, for jumping in there. Um, can I just ask you to do one more favor for me, Ewan? Um, I think there was a, a questions at the top dropped out for me and Peter Jones, I know, wrote one uh, second. Could you yeah. just read that one out for me because I've lost it and then, and then I can take it from there. Thank you. Certainly, certainly. Um, from Peter was, how do we ensure the availability, excuse me, I'll start again. How do we ensure the availability and usefulness of the massive amount of data, collecting, cleaning, curating, tagging, and analyzing internal and external data from multiple sources? Along with this, do we have the competence 
to identify and describe the relationships between data, as well as the ability to develop AI algorithms that have an ability to learn from current data lakes to identify patterns and probabilities to ensure operational advantage. Uh, we're starting on the journey. Let me be realistic about this. Um, <clears throat> what we have done in the work in the last year um, is absolutely to look in, in some detail at the relationships between our, our data, not just da our data within defence support, but other relationships with data in other uh, agencies in, and, and bodies, because there's a lot of you know, boundary items where we need to know who owns and manages that data. Is it us or you know, is it Navy or is it DNS? Um, and um, a number of initiatives that we, uh, we've taken in this space have been in combination with other organizations. So good news from that perspective. But defining logically what we want and actually making sure that it maps to what is really going on on the ground that is quite a long uh, tale of items. So 60,000 data items. I doubt whether more than 700 of those are really fundamental to, to what we're doing. Um, but to winnow down from those, those 60,000 to the 700 and, and know where each of those 700 is represented in all of the systems is undoubtedly a big data discovery task. And we are only now really experimenting with how to do that data discovery efficiently. So we're still two or three steps away from AI based exploitation of the data. Um, we are, uh, um, we've been looking at a number of tools that will enable us to do the analysis, but we're still, still some way to go. Ewan, any views from um, your I was, I was just going to say, it's great to hear that you know, Richard, the journey has started. Um, the, you know, the tools that allow you to adapt through AI and machine learning are available out there in the market. There is obviously, obviously the challenge of adoption and how do you choose and how do you make sure they're secure? And so many of them require them to be on the cloud rather than so your data has to go outside the boundary, which is normally difficult. Um, and I think from what I'm seeing from outside of defense, that the demand for highly skilled people, you know, defense are trying to recruit highly skilled people or find them from third parties. So I think we're, you know, you're, you're starting a journey in wider industry, including defense industry, are you know, trying to come along on that journey with you. And I'm sure you've had lots of pitches from people to say, oh, we can do that for you. So. I won't add to it, but uh, it's it's um it is a it, it is a challenge, but it's it's one we can tackle. Yes, and in fact, um, I use my chairman's prerogative because I missed my chance to begin with and ask a, a, a related question. Um, uh, because it, you're you're right. Every, there's always somebody who's got an answer for you. But one of the things that always struck me and and Richard. I, you know, now, now you're this far down the line with, you know, where we originally were talking about some of this, you know, where perfect is the enemy of the good. Mm. And certainly in my experience with JSAM and the foothills of CSG 21 and what I know ended up being the outputs of that may, may be far from perfect, but it's a quantum, genuinely a quantum leap forward from our ability to analyze from where we were before. Um, and as long as that risk margin is built in, then you understand the information you're dealing with based on the data you've used to get to that. Um, I don't know what your kind of views are on that, because, you know, it's, you're always searching the perfect, particularly in this space, seems to me to be a real break on progress. Richard, perhaps you've got a view on that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the same actually goes, if you don't mind me saying, for the latest technology. Mm. And frankly, I'd be quite happy to drag the MOD into about 2005. Um, and I would regard that as, you know, a good first, uh, first stepping stone. Um, so the, the, uh, the issue, um, uh, as I see it in a, in a lot of cases, is we don't know what good enough looks like. Mm. We don't have enough models of what, you know, what, is, what is sufficient. Um, 
and you, you spend the time either overwhelmed by the task that you don't actually uh, don't actually start it or know when to stop mm. <laughs> and that is often a, a critical um factor that leads us to um initiate a project half a dozen people and four years later there's still half a dozen people on the project and you you, you know when did we finish? Well, we didn't. It keep, just keeps on going on. It becomes a cottage industry. And I'm very much into, we have to have a project to, to deliver, deliver an outcome and the process that keeps that, uh, sustains that outcome thereafter. But they're not the same thing. And they're not the same size, hopefully, or, we, you know, or, or we're investing in great expenditure. Um, and uh, I have to remind my team of this because... Um, modeling is is one of those areas where you can never finish there is always a better model um, sufficient yes it's it's a challenge and one again where we want to take advice a lot of the uh, a lot of the time you know what's the pragmatic mean yeah absolutely you and your, your view on that I was, I was going to say, I think the it's that discovery where the pragmatic mean lives is in that uh, engagement and working together between the whoever's delivering a project, whether it's internal or external resource, and the people who are asking the questions. So, Angus, your questions have earlier, the project that focuses on one of those questions, for example, mm -hmm. you need the people asking those questions to be able to help say actually um, that answer is close enough to good or good enough to allow me to make a decision. So um, just this morning I was working with on a, a project that we brought in one of our OA guys, uh, David Cato came in to help us by saying we're looking at a transit time calculation that his team done several times and looking at another way of doing it and we're asking him that exact question well what's good enough how exact do you need to be what do you need to know to make the decisions that you're trying to make and it's not about perfection it's about i can now make a decision so for me it's that we've all seen it before in industry coming in and we, we've been past this before so i'll say we um we go away and we do this thing and we bring it back and say ta-da and it doesn't answer the question you need and it's not quite what you want. So I think, and possibly linking to some of the future questions around ways of working and people, we all talk about agile, but one of the key agile benefits is that close integration of product owner and stakeholder, the people, the, end, the ultimate end users, Richard, you said in your slides, we need those people to be involved in the decision-making around well, what's good enough. Mm. Uh, no, I entirely agree. And there's there's often a, a, a gap between um, the person looking at the wildcat spares and, and you know us sitting somewhere in a in a remote remote location thinking, well, you know, clearly you need this data about fault, but not that data. We need to enable, but not to go over the top. Mm. Yeah. Understood. Um, so that relationship between technologists and operators and, and finding that space in between that kind of says that's good enough is something that really does need to be uh, kind of worked through to your point, Richard. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm just going to switch quickly uh, just because of the available time. Um, Steve Clark's asked the uh, $60 million question. Is there a view on what is the cost to defence of poor data management um, and are we improving? So. Has it been quantified financially and, and are we able to measure uh, benefit from where we're getting as we improve um, in the application of better analytics, better data um, and so on? I personally don't think there's a lot of value in looking back at what we haven't achieved. Mm -hmm. What we do need to do, I think, is measure going forward quite closely. Um, so... I'm particularly interested in identifying specific use cases for data 
in a service or, or for a platform for a particular um, part of an organization and identifying with that use case what value has been realized out of it. And uh, it sounds a bit anecdotal, but I don't think we can work across the vast spread of data uh, and come up with a you know, pound, shilling, pence um, value. Whereas I can go to, uh, to Navy Digital uh, and say for type 31, you know, what does, what does it matter to you to be able to, uh, to um, have all your technical documentation delivered in you know this particular accessible digital form that really literally was a random um, um, item but you know there are lots of those kind of specifics um, the, thereafter I'd allow a thousand flowers to bloom I wouldn't follow up on every um, to a certain extent we were a bit hamstrung by benefits measurement and you know the, the desire to try and pin everything down to a to a benefits statement, if you've proved benefits over enough good exemplars in, in different kind of use cases, then go forward. Don't, you know, don't try and underwrite everything would be my take. Excellent. You and any, anything to add from your perspective from outside looking in? Uh, and only to uh, agree that benefits measurement is exceptionally difficult in data and when doing the boring and necessary stuff that we need to do to move forward because people see it as well it's not that shiny image that you had at the bottom of one of your slides Richard it's boring stuff at the top um, and in industry we have the same problem of we want to do these things how do we measure a benefit um, what is the current cost it's very difficult to do but yeah. as Richard said across industry we're also investing in data and technology and digital twins and making sure exactly the example Richard used of the documentation well can we do that for type 26 as well? So it's. Excellent. Yeah, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, uh, and it comes from Lee Daly and it kind of, it kind of comes to both your points about people. Um, but I sense it's also kind of vested in one of those sort of master data management kind of questions. So this is a great vision, but how are we going to change the behaviors that underpin how the customers use the data management systems. Um, I'll come to you first, Richard. I think it's probably uh, only by education, which is why I referenced the yeah. um, RLC work um, and that particular initiative. Um, we won't do it just by giving people data. <laughs> that might there there will be a few bright sparks who will be able to immediately use what what is on offer, but the vast majority of people do need a level of education about data out on the front line. So it, it, it should be mandatory <laughs> training, really. How, what is your data and how to exploit it? Um, because we're gonna be a data-led organization. Um, that data will, will, yes, be coming from back-end logistics systems, but it'll also be coming from the platform that you're standing on at that, at that time. And you have to know how to interpret that I think, and make use of it, rather than for it to be relayed back, you know, a thousand miles um, and, and have five data scientists then churn through it. To me, making our data available on the edge of, of where we operate is what gives the real support advantage. We can, we can be more efficient um, and more cost effective if we're doing things, you know, centrally in terms of forecasting and, and, and the, the OPDEF example and so on. Yes, that, that's great at a fleet management level, but at the individual level as well, we need data to be working for, for people. We need to upskill our... Yep, definitely. You there's, a, there's a parallel in, in the you know, industry customers, you know, we work we receive data from MOD, we provide data to MOD. And I think um, we need to be more mature about doing that. You know, we're quite often we are fighting over bits of data or not providing the data that's most useful. And that can be commercial, it can be historical you know, behaviors. 
again, as Richard says, it's education. It's education of both people on the MOD side, but also people on the industry side. Good. Um, I'm going to jump to um, a slightly different tack and um, come to Andrew, who's asked a question that says, a recent business Harvard Business Review article noted that there is one rapidly emerging concern that confronts every business these days when it comes to the ownership and management of data, and that is the assurance of responsible and ethical data use. How are MOD addressing this concern? That sounds like a big question to me. Um, uh, Ewan, I might come to you first and get a, kind of an industry view before I come to Richard while he, uh, you know, contemplates the MOD uh, support up to that. Um, obviously, I, I don't know how MOD addressing this concern. Um, industry, we share a concern. Exactly, exactly right, as Andrew points out from the HPR. Um, it's a ongoing concern about um, not only the traditional, if we aggregate all this data together, does it reveal something we don't want it to reveal? And that could impact individuals, could impact people who are in dangerous places who could be um, threatened through that. But there's also the, are we using this data to make unethical, unethical decisions? And just because AI can do it, should AI do it? How do we how do we weed out bias? How do we ensure that machine learning models, for example, are trained on um, a non-biased data set? And it's all very difficult. It's all I'm not going to pretend there's some magical answer that we've got in industry that MOD aren't using. It's it is difficult, and it's something that needs to be considered at every stage of a data journey. And we try to do that, but it's there are definitely going to be failures on the way. Richard? Yeah, I'm going to attempt to dodge the bullet here mm. by saying it's the exploitation of the data, which is where I think most of the, the ethical considerations fall. Though anybody who's read, read the, the Women in Data book, which I would recommend wholeheartedly as an exposure of how flawed data sets can lead to flawed decision making in, um, in a broadly cultural context. Um, that's quite an eye opener as to where we, where we need to start thinking. And I did uh, have a good friend who's a partner in a, one of the major um, business consultancy firms who uh, actually had, now has the title of, of data ethicist as part of his um, uh, of his many uh, many roles, and he does come knocking on my door saying, "You need to start thinking about this." Um, and I will admit, I haven't. I, in a sense, it's not in my immediate uh, foreground. As soon as I get to the point where I am aggregating large amounts of data and disseminating large amounts of data, even in the current control fashion, I'm sure it will come into play. Yeah. So I'll just regard myself that that question is a bit of a cattle prod. Um, I shall uh, bear it in mind. That's, that's why I leaped, leapt to it, Richard, because it was one of those ones that, you know, you could, you could uh, another boil the ocean question, isn't it, if you're not careful, but very important all the same. Um, uh, Liz, I apologise to those who have asked questions and I simply have not been able to get to them in, in the time. We have them recorded and we'll uh, make sure we uh, annotate them and uh, take them forward. Um, can I just say thank you, huge thank you to uh, you and, and Richard. Um, chunk of your time, you're both busy men and um, you know the foundation and our membership really appreciate the fact that you've um, supported the, uh, the discussion today. Um, I think I'm not going to try and uh, summarise everything you said, but, you know, the, the the bits that just come screaming through to is, you know, just the centrality of data to the proposition going forward. Um, the, the, the importance of coherence and consistency, which in any other word, I think we've, we've talked about in a number of different ways, um, either practically or in methodology. Um, I was very struck by this idea of treating data as a strategic asset. Um, it trips off the tongue very easily. And I think I, I, my sense is the MOD has got to that point with, you know, as you said, Richard, Charlie Forte, 
somebody now in charge of data, a data strategy, which was you know, hugely lacking in the past. Um, so, you know, I'm, it, it, it's great to see that. I guess for our foundation military members, um, this is designed to make you think hard about your own behaviors and how you look at data and use data and play your part in taking that forward. Um, and obviously for our um, industry members, um, I'm sure you will find some resonance in some of the things that have been said today, both in your own business, but how you relate to the MOD and do business with the MOD. Um, so I hope you found that useful. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. And um, I very much...